give a plug for the library and all I that. have to give a plug for the library what's coming up at the library stuff like that so <clears throat> and then and then I then I I, I still have the wicked sister because I, I I finished it last week but I still have it on my desk and I know that there's like holds on it that so people are going to be really happy when I bring that back down and turn it in tonight <laughs> 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 that's awesome uh, when the Marston's daughter first published you know i i would uh look at my local library and there would be like 50 holds and i'm like yes <laughs> yeah I, exactly yep in fact this you know, the wicked sister is so popular we had to order like three copies of it oh, so wow. <laughs> that's great all right so I want to welcome everybody um, that's showing up right now. Um, just to let you know, we are recording tonight, and you're probably all getting that. You know, we are recording. You have to uh, hit yes. But um, so if you if you want to review this um, uh, this event after after the fact, um, it's going to be posted to the Peter White Public Library um, page, so you'll be able to see it again and and relive the excitement again of tonight. <laughs> I recognize you. Nice to see you here tonight. Thanks for coming. <laughs> All right. Keep an eye on the time here. We got a couple more minutes and then we'll get started here. I always like, it, it always seems like such an intimate thing to have a Zoom Zoom event because you see into people's houses sometimes. It's so, I love being welcomed into people's houses. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually rent a room to Zoom from because oh, I'm in a very rural area and I do not have solid internet at my house. So uh, I rent a room in a nearby town and, and uh, this, is, this is where I do my Zoom calls from. Yeah. Well, this I'm coming from my office at the library, but sometimes I do it at home as well. But um, when I really want to make sure that I'm not going to end up with uh, unstable internet, mm -hmm. I always do it from like um uh, like last October. I did an event where we had um, Joy Harjo as a as a presenter, and there was no way I was going to trust my internet <laughs> with Joy Harjo and. Uh, Natasha Trethway and a few other people. It's just, um, yeah. Uh, so I completely yeah. understand. Um, <laughs> not too long after we moved here, but before we sold our house in Detroit, I I actually zoomed with the producer of the Marsh King's Daughter movie. I drove to Detroit oh. <laughs> so that I would have my usual background and solid internet. I wasn't going to mess that one up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's just some. There's somewhere, you know, I'm like, oh, I think that will be fine. But like for you and Joy Harjo and Natasha Trethway and the other ones, it's like, no, we're going to we're going to use my office. <laughs> nice. And then I promised my son, too, that I'm taking him out for pizza after tonight. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> he's excited about you he's also excited about the pizza too so yeah <laughs> all right well you know what i'm gonna get started here um with the uh, introduction and um then we're gonna there then we'll get rolling oh here comes another person i know this person Roslyn. she's a good friend of mine um oh boy i spoke too soon two people have entered so just a second <laughs> Okay. All right. Now we have 14 people here. I'm glad. I always get nervous when there's 13 people in a meeting. I don't like that number in a meeting for some reason. It just doesn't seem right. So I like the evenness of this. All right. Okay. So um, uh, uh, welcome everybody to um, Peter White Public Library. My name's Marty Ackett, and I'm the adult programming the library and um, I just want to uh, uh, give a few uh, thank yous here for um, groups that make this event possible. Um, one is um, the uh, the Peter White the friends of the Peter White Public Library who provide the funds for the authors reading virtually series. 
And they also provide funds for so much of what we do, including all of the live streaming and everything else that we do here from the library. So um, they're, they're just a, sort of an integral part of what goes on here at the library. Um, and um, just uh, make you aware of a few things that are gonna be upcoming um, here um, in the next uh, week or so. Um, tomorrow night, we have our uh, monthly um, women in science uh, meeting. And just give me a second here. Um, women in science meeting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, tomorrow night, it's going to be um, uh, a woman named um, Eva Bergner, who's a, a doctor, has a direct doctorate in nurse practitioner. And she's going to be talking about um, closed head injuries. Um, so uh, that's her specialty. And so um, I think that's going to be really a, a really fascinating um, uh, presentation. And then next week, um, we have a few things upcoming um, as part of the Pine Mountain Music Festival. Um, we have uh, Scott Flavin, who is the one of the directors of the Pine Mountain Music F Festival, is going to be doing what's called a peak performance class, which um, is for people who want to get over stage fright. I think that I have to take that sometimes too. Uh, getting in front of a large group of people is always a little daunting, um, but if you're a performer or play an instrument and get a little um, stage fright, that's that's a, um, a, an event that you might wanna check into. And then um, on next Tuesday, our Concert on the Steps uh, kicks off uh, for the summer with um, Carrie Yost, a really wonderful um, local performer. And that, and that event will also be um, live streamed via YouTube. So all kinds of other things going on through the end of the month as well. You can check the Peter White Public Library page for that. But um, um, now that I've gotten all that out of the way, we'll get to the main event tonight. Um, that's sort of like the coming attractions, right? But um, it's my honor to be introducing tonight's featured writer, um, author Karen Dion. Um, when I first dreamed up authors reading virtually a couple years ago, I had no idea that I'd be introducing U.S. Poet Laureates, best-selling writers like Karen Dion, uh, YA novelists and award-winning poets. Um, it has been a thrill every month to sit down and speak with these gifted artists. Plus, it's really cool when I'm at parties now to take out my cell phone and show my list of contacts that uh, uh, of all that, the, that are on there that includes like U.S. Poet Laureates and, and all the uh, authors reading virtually alumni. And you know what? Karen is in my contacts now, too, for her email and everything. So that's really cool. Really cool. Um, but um, USA Today and number one internationally best-selling author Karen Dion writes award-winning psychological suspense set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness. Um, both The Marsh King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister were selected as Michigan notable books by the Library of Michigan and have been translated into dozens of languages and landed on bestseller lists around the world. In addition, The Marsh King's Daughter will be released soon as a major motion picture starring Daisy Ridley and Ben Mendelsohn. And here's a little fact for you. If you're doing the math, that puts everyone in this Zoom meeting tonight at one degree of separation from the Star Wars films. One degree, because Daisy Ridley played the character of Rey in the recent uh, um, Star Wars sequels. So um, there you go. You are like one step away from C-3PO and all those ones. So um, anyway, um, I just finished uh, reading The Wicked Sister um, last week. And it is just as thrilling and complex as The Marsh King's Daughter. Um, it's a book I would describe as unputdownable. I, I know that's not a word, but it is. That's what it is. It's unputdownable. Um, so give yourself plenty of time when you start it. If you begin reading this book at night, I expect to be up very, very late. So um, please join me in welcoming to Peter White Public Library, um, Karen Dion. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming. You know, um, authors, we, we spend so much time alone at our desks or, you know, writing on the computer or writing by hand. And the real treat, of course, is to be able to see writers, especially face to face, those of you who had the video on. Thank you. <laughs> I get to see you as well as, as talk to you. So I thought for those who don't know a lot about me and who I am, I would start with, um, I have a short 
not a video presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that gives a little bit of my writing history and tells a little bit about my books and also why I write my novels that are set in the Upper Peninsula. So um, basically, without further ado, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And I apologize for those who are on the phone, you're not going to see these slides. So I'll try to describe them at least a little bit as, as they show across the screen. But that won't be the whole evening. So uh, thanks for that. Now let's see. Share screen. And I want that one. And. Okay, am I seeing it? Boy, it looks like my computer's being slow. Can it, can everybody see this? There we go. That's what we want. Okay, <laughs> so I I titled this presentation my twenty year journey to best selling author because honestly, that's how long it took from the time I started writing seriously to the time that the Marsh King's Daughter um, published. Yeah, I, my hope is if there's any aspiring writers in the audience that it doesn't take you 20 years. There's no set time, of course, but that's that was my experience. So um, my early novels were science-based thrillers, similar to what Michael Crichton writes. Um, in 2008, I published, uh, well, I, um, I was published in mass market paperback size. That's the little kind of book that you see in grocery stores and drugstores by Berkeley. So Freezing Point and Boiling Point were considered environmental thrillers because they were, they were science-based thrillers, but they had a strong environmental theme. And then in 2014, I wrote a novel based on the television show, The Killing. And that might sound glamorous, you know, being hired by the, the studio to write a book based on their property, but it's what's called work for hire. So I was paid a flat fee to write the book and um, I don't own the copyright to it. While I was doing this, because you can see that's a span of some years, I was also organizing conferences for writers in New York. New York. I started an online organization called Backspace. It was just discussion forums of us for aspiring writers. Um, I purposely made this screen a bit of a jumble because um, there was a conferences in New York. There was the the online conferences. Um, for a little while, I organized and ran a week long retreat for writers in the Bahamas. You know, I say it's a dirty job, but you know, somebody's got to do it. And so as I was doing all of this, I actually wasn't writing. And there were a lot of times when I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, I've, I've had some published novels. That's great. The conferences are very successful and it's very satisfying to help other people reach their publishing goals. So there were a lot of times I thought about quitting writing and just, you know, being a conference organizer instead. But as it happened in the lead up to my 2013 Backspace Writers Conference in New York City, I happened to notice that a writer who had gotten her literary agent and subsequently been published uh, at one of my previous conferences, she was coming out with her next book and I hadn't written anything. And it just hit me and I thought, you know, I'm not done. So, so I dialed back on all of these extracurricular activities to concentrate on my writing. And it wasn't too much longer after that that I got the idea for The Marsh King's Daughter. So for people who don't know, uh, haven't read the book and aren't familiar with it, The Marsh King's Daughter tells the story of a girl who for um, the first 12 years of her life, she lives with her mother and father in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by a marsh or swamp in the Tequamanan River Basin in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And during that time, she, she loves her life. She doesn't see anyone except her mother and father, but this is the only life she knows. She adores her father, just even worships him. She finds out when she's 12, the reason they live like that is because her father kidnapped her mother when her mother was a teenager, and she's the product of that crime. So that's half the story. In the present day part of the story, and I love describing the book to Michigan readers because you know all these places that I'm talking about. So in the present day part of the story, she's a young mother of two little girls. She's living south of Grand Marais. Her husband doesn't know her history because there was a lot of notoriety when she and her mother left the marsh and um, she just wanted to put all that behind her. So she reinvented herself, took on a new name and so forth. Excuse me, just a moment. And so at that point, <coughs> Her father has been in the maximum security prison in Marquette for a dozen years. He escapes during a prison transfer between Newberry and Marquette. 
he disappears into the Sini Wildlife Refuge, or so he leads police to believe. But Helena, she knows he's coming for her and her daughters. And she knows that, you know, the police aren't going to be able to find him. She's the only one that can find him because he taught her how to hunt and track when she was a little girl. So in, in the story, in the present, there's this cat and mouse game between Helena and her father, you know, who will find each other first, interspersed with stories from the past. So the Marsh King's daughter. Um, you would have to take all of my previous publishing experience, combine it, and then supersize it to equal what happened for the Marsh King's Daughter. For one thing, the Marsh King's Daughter has been translated and published in 26 languages around the world. And these are most of them here. You can see the covers. And I think it's fun to look at how they compare. Um, you know, there's a, all, all are quite similar. If you read any of these languages, you might notice that not every title says The Marsh King's Daughter. That's because it's up to the publisher what they're going to call the book and to design a cover uh, that will appeal to readers in that particular country. So that was certainly very exciting and fun. And The Marsh King's Daughter did go on to become a bestseller in Germany and Sweden and Iceland. So that was also very exciting. Marsh King's Daughter has been nominated for or won a number of awards. Um, Marty already mentioned that it was a, a Michigan notable book. It was also the winner of the Barry Award and the Crimson Scribe Award for Best Novel. These are, are fairly recognizable awards in the mystery and thriller world. Um, at the end of the year, it was named one of the best books of 2017 by iBooks, Hudson Booksellers, Library Journal, Shelf Awareness, and a lot of other booksellers and reviewers. The Marsh King's Daughter also got a rave review in the New York Times. And for an author, that's basically, you know, kill me now, it's not going to get any better than this, right? You know, to have your book reviewed in the New York Times is just, uh, it, it's mind blowing. And then, you know, there was not a, a, a sour word in the review. So that was really exciting, but there was more and we've already mentioned it. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter will soon be released as a major motion picture. This screen shows the um, studio STX that's distributing the film and the producers that um, made the movie, uh, Black Bear Pictures and Anonymous Content. And these production companies are responsible for movies like Spotlight and The Revenant and The Imitation Game and I Care A Lot. Um, the director, his movies are Limitless, The Upside, Divergent. So, you know, really, really wonderful, talented um, people are, you know, committed to, to making a beautiful film. Uh, we've already mentioned that the, the movie stars Daisy Ridley as Helena and Ben Mendelsohn as Jacob, her father. Uh, this is the supporting cast because there are um, sections of the movie that's also said in the past. Brooklyn Prince plays the young Helena. Uh, Karen Pistorius is Helena's mother in the past and Garrett Hedlund is Helena's husband in the present. Gil Birmingham has a role in the movie that's not in the book. So there'll be a little surprise for uh, if you've read the book first when you see the movie. So the, the Marsh King's Daughter movie has been in the works for about five years. Um, every time there was a little bit of forward movement, my literary agent would say, don't get excited, it's Hollywood, anything can happen. And indeed he's right because uh, over that period of time, there have been three actresses attached to play Helena, and there have been five directors attached to the project. But a year ago last spring, things really started coming together. That's when Daisy Ridley came on and the director and others, um, the producer, yeah, the president of Black Bear Pictures um, wanted to meet me by Zoom. And so we had a Zoom call. He told me then that filming was set to start on June 14. So I was excited, right? But my literary agent says, no, no, don't get excited. It can fall apart, you know? Don't get excited until they're actually filming. So sure enough, on June 14, Black Bear Pictures posted this on their Instagram feed. And, you know, I just, I still pinch myself when I see this picture. Did I ever dream that the title of my book would be on a movie clapper board, The Marsh King's Daughter? You know, uh, no, I didn't. So I sent this picture to my literary agent and I said, now can I get excited? <laughs> and he said, not until you cash their check. So, so that's how he is. Anyway, 
The movie was filmed last summer uh, entirely in Canada. And I know Michigan readers find that a little disappointing that it was not filmed in the Upper Peninsula. But there are so many considerations when it comes to choosing a location for the, a movie, not the least of which was the COVID situation last summer, right? So, uh, but the producer promised me that he would find locations that looked like the Upper Peninsula. So this I think is kind of cool. So this is my photograph of the Taquamina River Valley um, or basin, just exactly where in my mind the story takes place. And this is their picture of the marsh that they found in Canada. So isn't that, isn't that lovely? I mean, it's so similar. It, it really does nail the, the look of the Upper Peninsula. And also um, they, they did some filming at a place called the French River for, and, and it, you know, it's just gorgeous. Uh, I, some of these pictures to me, it looks like the Upper Peninsula on steroids. You know, it's just so, so beautiful. When they started filming here, it was a very, um, because the location was so remote, I found out that it required a 20 minute boat ride for both the cast, the crew, the equipment, everything, excuse me, to get to the location where they were filming. They also, lowered equipment by helicopter. These little video clips were posted by the director and I just think, well, wow. <laughs> they really went all out to get just the perfect location for this movie. So that was last summer. Uh, this spring, then um, after the movie is filmed, which it's actually filmed over a very short period. Um, this spring, the director started posting a few pictures to show how they were working on the movie now in the studio. So this is a picture of the room where they're doing sound mixing. And of course that's Daisy in her role as Helena. And this is, no, the first one was color correction. This one's sound mixing. <laughs> so, you know, you, and this is a clearer picture. You can see the size of the screen and, and the people working on the film. And then the director also posted this picture. And he said, the movie is finished done. This was around April, something like that. And um, that, of course, was super exciting. More recently, I, I want to say three weeks ago now, um, STX Films sent me a link to where I could watch the movie. So I have actually seen the finished movie, which was so amazing. The, the link was live or, or active for a week. And, and during that week, I watched the movie nine times. <laughs> I think I'd still be watching it if they, it's a good thing they took the link away from me because, you know, so did I like it? I love it. It is so beautiful. Um, I just couldn't have asked for, for a better film. The acting is stupendous. The, the locations, as you've already seen, are so beautiful. The, the sound, the music, everything is just really, really lovely. So, you know, I watched it on my phone, on my tablet, on my, my television in the basement, where I took this screenshot. <laughs> you can see um, the version that they gave me. It has a watermark, Karen Dion, and it says property of SDX Films, you know, so I was not to share it with anyone. So I'm, I'm making a little exception, but again, you know, I'm sure that you can imagine how extraordinary this must feel for me to know that, you know, as people watch the movie, they're going to see this particular screen um, based on the book by Karen Dion, that's me. And there were times when I was watching the movie that I, you know, recognized bits of dialogue and I recognized certain scenes as things that I had, I had dreamed up. So uh, yeah, super duper exciting, that's for sure. So that's The Marsh King's Daughter. Uh, Wicked Sister is my follow-up book to The Marsh King's Daughter. And um, when I, when I, took the uh, offer from uh, Putnam to uh, publish The Marsh King's Daughter. It, it, it was what's called a two book deal. And so I had a discussion with my editor early on about what, what would the second book be because I, I didn't know. And he said, he named four things that he felt the follow-up book, which became The Wicked Sister should share with The Marsh King's Daughter. And that is that it would have a, the same or similar setting. It would also be psychological suspense. It would have a fairy tale element, which, you know, I haven't explained that, but those of you who've read the book know that the Marsh King's daughter incorporates the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale of the same name. And um, the book would also have an intricate structure. 
So I was particularly pleased that he named those last two because those were two of the things that I was most proud of in, in the book, The Marsh King's Daughter. But then of course, for me, the challenge became, how am I going to incorporate those four elements without copying The Marsh King's Daughter, right? I wanted to do something different. So I won't, I won't go into detail about what I did that was different, but I'm really happy with how The Wicked Sister turned out. Uh, Wicked Sister has also been published, I think, in 10 languages so far. Um, this time around, the covers are very different, aren't they? But, uh, and they're, again, they're not always called the Wicked Sister. The German one, uh, top middle, is uh, the Raven's Daughter. So for some reason, they thought that would be a better title for the book, which is fine. You know, I, I don't know the German thriller market, so if they think that will work. And come to think of it, it did hit the bestseller list in Germany. So they definitely knew what they were doing over there in Germany. Um, the Wicked Sister has also uh, had some awards and honors. Again, a Michigan notable book. Publishers Weekly, which is a trade magazine, actually chose it as one of their best books of 2020. They chose 12 thrillers. And if you just stop and think about that for a minute, Think of all of the thriller authors you know, you know, amazingly talented and, and best-selling authors. I don't know how many um, thrillers are published in a given year, but, you know, it's, I'm sure it numbers at least a couple hundred. So um, really extraordinary to be singled out like that. And, um, and then, as I mentioned, it also became an international bestseller. So now we get to the nitty gritty. Why am I setting these uh, suspense novels in the Upper Peninsula, right? Well, it's because I lived in the Upper Peninsula for 30 years, beginning in the 1970s when my husband and I homesteaded as a young married couple with our infant daughter. We lived in that little blue tent while we built our cabin. We carried water from a stream. Um, as I mentioned, our daughter was six weeks old. She's a little older here. Uh, so she basically lived in the tent and lived outside. I know she looks worried in this picture, but I promise you she had a wonderful time. <laughs> and so this is, you know, us as a young married couple standing in front of the house that we built. And um, I would, I, I'd like to mention because the Wicked Sister opens in the Newberry Mental with a character in the Newberry Mental Hospital. And I'll read from that shortly. But, um, and I'm playing fast and loose with the dates because, you know, the hospital has been closed for a long time. Uh, we all know that. But this window behind us came from the dump at the Newberry Mental Hospital. Uh, that's why it's, you know, heavy frame and small panes and so forth. Uh, of course, there was no glass in it. We cleaned it all up and, and reclaimed it. So uh, this is what the house looked like by our first winter there. And then this is what the house ended up looking like inside. And again, you can see that window from the mental hospital. I think we did a great job myself. Um, anyway, that's, that's the little cabin that we built. So as I was writing, especially the Marsh King's daughter, but the Wicked Sister as well, I, in many ways, it felt like I was writing a memoir, you know, so in the Marsh King's daughter, Helena imagines what it was like for her mother to take care of an infant in such primitive circumstances. And, you know, she imagines her mother washing her diapers by hand in a bucket. Well, been there, done that, and it's every bit as nasty as it sounds. <laughs> Plus, when it came to the natural world, again, you know, the back to the land movement, that was young people from the city who wanted to live closer to nature. So we paid attention to, you know, where things grew and what time of year, and, and we sampled wild foods like um, cattail heads and milkweed pods. So again, you know, I was able to put all of that into the novel. In fact, the, um, the New York Times review, he, uh, the reviewer singled out two things that he said make the novel so superb, <laughs> his words, not mine. And one that he named was the authenticity of the setting. He said, you know, when the author touches on things having to do with the natural world, you can tell that her knowledge goes deeper than Wikipedia. And so uh, I, I wish I could tell him uh, how I got my knowledge about the Upper Peninsula and the, the flora and fauna. People have asked me if this cabin is still here. It's not as remote as you might think. Um, we built our cabin on M28. Uh, if you're familiar, it's between McMillan and Sini. 
uh, not too far from the Danaher Road, because my husband was a stoneware potter at the time, and we thought that we would have a pottery studio and we would catch the tourists going by. So if you're driving down across M28 in that stretch, um, this is what you'll see. <laughs> so this is what our cabin looks like now. The current owner put a second story on it and an addition behind it. Um, but see, there's the stonework that my husband and I did in the window. It's still there. So that um, makes me feel really good that the cabin we built 40 odd years ago is, is still, still there, still part of it. I was on um, book tour in uh, through the Upper Peninsula a couple of years ago before COVID, obviously, and um, I know who owns the house. So I uh, and her car was there. So I stopped and she invited me in for a cup of tea. So I sat in her living room, which was the space that that we made all those years ago. And um, that was really a nice feeling. So people have asked me, <laughs> what am I working on now? Right. What's next? So I am working on another novel um, set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This one is, uh, the working title is The Counterfeit Granddaughter. Whether that will stay the title, I don't know. But it's about uh, a young woman who, she was a crack baby. She grew up in foster care. She just never had a chance. And she lives in a really poor rundown neighborhood in Detroit. She makes her living running grandparent scams. So she calls up old people pretending to be their granddaughter and gives them some story about why she needs money. And, and that's how that's what she does. As the book opens, she's her, her apartment has burned down. She makes one more grandma call. And this time, for the first time, she tells the truth about why she needs money. And so grandma not only sends her money, but she says, come stay with me. And so my, my girl does, because as it happens, grandma has never met her granddaughter. Very convenient. You know, we can do that when we write books. So that's the device that gets her up to Grand Marais, um, which is where my the third novel, the one I'm working on now, takes place. And the reason I said it there, so the Marsh King's daughter uses the, the marsh or the swamp or the wetland as its main setting. The Wicked Sister uses the forest. And I wanted now uh, this third book uses Lake Superior because, you know, the lakes are such a big, big part of Michigan, all of the Great Lakes. Lake Superior is by far my favorite. I love the, the wildness of it. So the climactic scene will take place in a, in a charter fishing boat on Lake Superior in a storm. <laughs> you guys can tell me if I managed to pull it off, but uh, I'm really looking forward to writing that particular scene. So um, that's that's it as far as my um, slide presentation. Uh, I was invited to do some reading. So I want to read just from the opening of The Wicked Sister so you can get a little taste of, of what that book is like. And I guess I'll stop the screen share at this point too. So, you know, you all can see each other if you're going to, um, you know, if you have gallery view or you can see me if you have speaker view. So this is how the Wicked Sister begins. And it's chapter one, and it's told in the voice of Rachel. She says, sometimes when I close my eyes, there is a rifle in my hands. My hands are small, my fingers are pudgy. I'm 11 years old. There's nothing special about this particular rifle, nothing to distinguish it from any other Remington, except that this is the rifle that killed my mother. In my vision, I am standing over my mother. The rifle is pointing at her chest. Her mouth is open and her eyes are closed. Her chest is red. My father runs into the front hallway. Rachel, he screams when he sees me. He drops to his knees, gathers my mother in his arms, looks up at me, his expression an unfamiliar jumble of shock and horror. He rocks my mother for a long time as if she is a baby, as if she is alive. At last, he lays her gently on the worn parquet floor and gets slowly to his feet. He takes the rifle from my trembling hands and looks at me with a sorrow greater than I can comprehend and turns the rifle on himself. Not so, says the golden orb spider from the middle of her web in a corner of my room where the cleaners never sweep. Your father killed your mother and then he killed himself. I don't understand why the spider is lying. Spiders normally tell the truth. How do you know? I can't resist asking. She wasn't there when my parents died. I was. 
The spider regards me solemnly from eight shiny eyes. I know, she says, we all know. Her spiderlings skitter about the edges of the web as insubstantial as dust motes and nod. I want to tell the spider that she is wrong, that I know better than anyone what happened the day my parents died. And I understand the consequences of my childhood crime better than she ever will because I've been living with them for 15 years. Once you've taken someone's life, it breaks you, shatters you into so many infinitesimal pieces that no one and nothing can put you together again. Ask any drunk driver who killed a pedestrian, any hunter who thought the friend or brother-in-law he shot was a deer, anyone who held a loaded rifle when she was too young to anticipate what was about to happen. My therapists say I'm suffering from complicated grief disorder and promise I'll get better in time. My therapists are wrong. I'm getting worse. I can't sleep, and when I do, I have nightmares. I get frequent headaches, and my stomach hurts all the time. I used to think constantly about killing myself until I realized that living in a mental hospital for the rest of my life is the greater punishment. I eat, I sleep, I read, I watch TV, I go outside. I breathe the warm summer air, feel the sun on my skin, listen to the birds chirp and the insects hum, watch the flowers bloom and the leaves turn and the snow fall and through it all, always, always in the front of my mind and deep in my heart burns this terrible truth. I am the reason my parents will never see, smell, taste, laugh, or love again. My parents are dead because of me. The police ruled my parents' deaths a murder-suicide perpetrated by my father. All the news reports I've been able to find agree. Peter James Cunningham, age 45, murdered his wife, Jennifer Marie Cunningham, age 43, for undetermined reasons, and then turned the rifle on himself. Some speculate that I saw my father shoot my mother, and that's why I ran away. Others, that I found my parents' body, and this is what sent me over the edge. I would have told them that I was responsible if I had been able to speak. When I came out of my catatonia three weeks later, I made sure that everyone who would listen knew what I had done. But to this day, no one believes me, not even the spider. Chapter two. I leave the spider to her offspring and check my watch, a cheap plastic model my Aunt Charlotte bought at the dollar store after the last one she gave me was stolen, then head down two flights to the community room. My footsteps echo in the empty stairwell. I'm wearing tennis shoes, Velcro fasteners, the only kind we're allowed. The ceramic floor tiles are cracked or missing, the plaster on the walls and ceiling flaked and peeling. My room is in one of the oldest buildings that dates from the hospital's opening in 1895, back when it was called the Upper Peninsula As Asylum for the Insane. Newberry Regional Mental Health Center, as it's known today, is definitely better, but it is what it is, one of two major adult psychiatric hospitals in the state of Michigan, this one in the Upper Peninsula and the other in the Lower, where the mentally ill go to get better and the terminally insane live out their days. I fall somewhere in between. The community room is as dreary as you'd expect of a hundred year old mental institution. Dirt stained cream colored walls, worn green asbestos floor tile, heavy metal, metal framed multi-paned windows so no one can jump out, vinyl chairs and couches packed with duct tape, patched with duct tape and bolted to the floor. It's also noisy. The television turned up far too loud so it can be heard over the conversations of visitors and patients who are talking much too loudly so they can be heard over the noise of the television. The man I am meeting waves from a table in the corner. When Trevor Lato called asking if he could interview me for one of those where are they now follow-up stories, I realized that the universe had given me a gift. For 15 years, the idea that my father murdered my mother has stood unchallenged. I am the only one who knows that he did not. This interview is a chance to do something good with my useless waste of a life, possibly the only one I'll get since reporters haven't exactly been knocking down my door. Still, I'm nervous. Telling an aspiring reporter that I killed my mother and letting him publish my truth is bound to carry consequences. Skepticism and ridicule if I am not believed or if my story is considered credible, a police investigation, my father's exoneration, possibly jail time for me. I remind myself that I want to do this, 
Trevor may have initiated this interview, but I am here by choice. I sit, he sits, I wait. Okay, if I record this? He reaches into a green canvas messenger bag and places a digital recorder on the table between us without waiting for my answer. Um, yeah, sure, I say, though the thought of him carrying away a recording of our conversation makes me queasy. It hasn't been easy going from a terrified 11 year old so traumatized by what she'd done that she could neither move nor speak to where I am today, which, well, at least I can walk and talk. I'm told I was completely unresponsive to both verbal and physical stimuli when I arrived. I remember I could see and hear, but by the time I thought of what I wanted to do or say, speaking or moving just didn't seem worth the effort. I know that sounds odd, but that's the best way I can describe it. I wasn't bored because I had no sense of the passage of time. Hours felt like minutes, days like hours. The three weeks I spent trapped in an uncooperative body fed by a nasogastric tube and drained by a catheter morphed into a single interminable day. More than anything, I remember an overwhelming weariness no child should have to know. At times, it seemed like too much effort even to breathe. I was lost in a swirl of thoughts and memories outside my control. I am in the gun room. I lift the rifle to my shoulder. I shoot the lion in the great room. I shoot a zebra and a gazelle. I am a big game hunter and not an 11 year old girl who loves all creatures equally and wouldn't hurt a fly. What are you doing? My mother yells when she sees me, put the gun down. And so I do. There's a big bang. My mother falls. She doesn't get up. A scene that loops in my head like a movie reel, unvarying in every detail. The reporter starts with a series of softball questions, which I lob back easily, then shifts in his chair, signaling a change in the conversation. I get ready. I am very good at reading body language. In a place like this, you have to be. Now let's talk about your early years, he says. Tell me what your life was like before you came to the hospital. Before I came to the hospital, I begin feeding his exact words back to him using the listening technique I learned from my therapist to send the subtle message that he and I are on the same page. My childhood was very happy. My parents were one of those couples who truly loved each other. You know the kind I'm talking about. Can't leave for work in the morning without a kiss, a real one, and not just a peck, holding hands when they walk down the street sitting next to each other on a sofa when they're reading or watching television instead of sitting at opposite ends. My sister says our parents were more in love on the day they died than on the day they met, and I can believe it. We were both homeschooled, so we spent a lot of time together. The four of us, along with my mother's sister, lived in this amazing two-story log cabin built by my great-great-grandfather on 4,000 acres southeast of Marquette back in the Timber Baron days. But I guess you know that, I add, thinking of the millions of words that have been written about us. It's all right. I'd like to hear it in your own words. Okay, then. My parents were wildlife biologists, as I'm sure you also know. Our property was surrounded by tall cliffs on three sides and a large lake on the fourth. Very isolated, very pristine. My parents used to say that living and working in this amazing ecological microsystem was like heaven on earth. And because my parents, father's parents owned the area my mother and father was studying, and my parents financed their own research, they didn't have to answer to anyone. So how they conducted their work and what they chose to study was entirely under their control. My father's focus was amphibians, while my mother studied black bears. They used to joke that my mother had twice as much testosterone as my father, because of their choices, you know. The reporter smiles and writes my parents' joke in his notepad. So, which did you prefer? frogs or bears. I loved anything that moved, I answered diplomatically, though the truth is amphibians really don't do much for me, while I'm as crazy about black bears as my mother ever was and always will be. I used to go with my parents on their rounds. One day I'd be slogging around the ponds and creeks, draped in mosquito netting and wearing hip waders like my father, collecting water samples and counting tadpoles and scooping up frogs, and the next I'd be crouching alongside my mother in her observation blind, watching a 500 pound black bear nosing around our bait station a few feet away. So you were comfortable wandering the woods by yourself? I was. Tramping around the woods on my own was no different for me than the way a city kid learns to navigate the subway. 
He nods as if I've confirmed something important, though I can't imagine what, then pulls his messenger bag toward him and digs through it and comes up with a plain manila folder. I want to show you something. This is a copy of the police report. No photos, he adds quickly. He riffles through the folder and pulls out a piece of paper and lays it on the table between us. Right here, he taps the middle of the page. This is where it talks about your disappearance. Of course, he's zeroed in on the most sensational part of my story, though if he's hoping for a scoop, he's exactly 15 years too late. Anyone can Google my name along with Missing Girl and find plenty of articles about my disappearance from tabloids to the national news. Missing Girl Found and Miracle Girl Survives Two Week Wilderness Ordeal Returns to Civilization Unable to Speak. And my personal favorite, Real Life Mowgli Saved by Wolves? The report says that by the time police arrived, you'd already gone missing, he prompts, as if I don't know the details of my own story. They set up a search, but by then the ground was too trampled to know which way you'd gone. Then that night it snowed, which wiped out any chance of picking up your trail in the morning. Still, they searched for days, helicopters, tracking dogs, the works, though as more and more time went by, everyone had to admit that you were most likely dead. Right. Until two weeks later, a passing motorist found me lying beside the highway I cut in, trying to hurry things along so we can move on to the topic I came to discuss. Lying beside the highway, unable to move or speak, he adds, which I'll grant is a fairly dramatic detail. And yet, aside from that, and a few scratches and bruises, physically, you were in remarkably good shape. But here's the thing, Rachel, I grew up in the Upper Peninsula. I know what the weather is like in early November. Temps below freezing at night and with that fresh snowfall, there's no way you should have survived those two weeks on your own. Yet somehow you did. I know you couldn't remember anything at the time, but what about now? Is there anything at all that you can tell me? What did you eat? How did you keep warm? Where did you sleep? He looks so hopeful, I'm tempted to make something up to satisfy him and his future readers. It occurs to me that I could tell him anything and no one could contradict me. Unfortunately, those days are as much a mystery to me now as they were then. Plus, I really hate when people don't tell the truth. Sorry, no, I still don't remember a thing. My therapist tried to help me get my memories back. I think they saw me as a personal challenge. I was this mystery girl, this wild child who turned up two weeks after she went missing with no idea of where she'd been or what she'd been doing. But eventually, we had to accept that those memories are gone for good. But are they really? Don't scientists say we retained everything we've seen or heard? Those memories must be rattling around in your brain somewhere. Well, yes, technically that's true. I meant my memories are gone in the sense that I can't access them. Believe me, we tried. The thing you have to understand about memories associated with childhood trauma is that the brain processes these differently than normal ones. Sometimes burying them so deeply, a person doesn't even realize that the reason they're struggling as an adult is because of something that happened to them when they were a child. What I don't tell him is that I don't want to remember those days and never did, which no doubt was a big factor in my therapist's collective failure. If whatever happened during that time was so disturbing that my brain felt the need to erase it, I don't want to know. Could you just take a look, please? Maybe reading the report will jog something loose. I take the folder he's holding out to me, even though reading the details of that day is just about the last thing I want to do. Basically, I'm throwing him a bone because he drove 100 miles to interview me, and we both know I haven't given him much. I scan the pages quickly, pretending to be interested, until I come upon a line drawing of a child next to a picture of a massive rifle. And then I really am interested. I read the associated paragraph. After the daughter was recovered, the ME examined the girl and found no evidence of bruising on her limbs or torso consistent with having fired a 458 Winchester Magnum. Given the size of the weapon relative to the girl's height and weight, as well as the lack of physical evidence, the ME ruled that the daughter did not fire the rifle. My heart pounds. I place the folder carefully on the table and wipe my hands on my jeans and stick them under my legs to stop them from shaking. I don't understand. I shot my mother. I killed her. I know I did. 
I've seen myself standing over her body with the rifle so many, many times. And yet there's no reason to think that this paragraph is anything other than fact. Whoever wrote this report couldn't have made this up. The details are too specific, too easy to disprove. Even I can see that the rifle in the picture, which is not the Remington I see in my visions, is so big, it would have been all but impossible for the 11 year old me to pick it up. I read the report again. Given the size of the weapon relative to the, to the girl's height and weight, as well as the lack of physical evidence, the ME ruled that the daughter did not fire the rifle. It's impossible, yet the truth is right in front of me in black and white. I didn't kill my mother. I couldn't have. According to the police report, I never even fired that rifle. And that's where I'm going to stop for the, for the evening. So uh, thank you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed that little taste of the Wicked Sister. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Uh, Marty's going to run this part of the show. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, you can unmute yourself or put your questions in uh, the chat and I'll relay those. I have a question from Maddie um, and it's, how do you approach the writing of characters who do horrible things and still make them empathetic? Thank you, Maddie. That's a great question. You know, I, I say that writers, in a way, we're like character actors. You know, we inhabit, we become the character that we're writing about. So um, I have, when I write like Helena's father and the Marsh King's daughter, and, you know, there is a wicked sister, obviously, in the book, The Wicked Sister, um, I... I actually mentally I'm very sympathetic to them because I'm inhabiting their head and I know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, nobody is just purely evil for the sake of evil. Um, even the, the worst person has in their mind reasons for why, why they're doing these things that they do. So um, yeah, that's, that's sort of a trick. You know, I, I don't think I'm unique in this. I think writers do this. We, we, uh, can't write the character accurately unless we we think like they think and feel what they're feeling. So that's that's the short answer. And um, I might add, maybe there's a dark side in me. I don't know if we're even thinking of these things. Um, when my my middle daughter read The Marsh King's Daughter, uh, she loved it, of course. But she says uh, it kind of creeps me out that my mother thought of these things. So <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, Karen, when I when I uh, told one of the other people, one of the um, supervisors here that I that you were going to be reading, she was like, she is the nicest person in the world. I don't know how she writes such dark things. So, <laughs> well, and, and I will say this about the darkness of my stories. I think of my stories as ultimately stories of redemption. Both Helena in The Marsh King's Daughter and Rachel in The Wicked Sister had something they have like a traumatic childhood that they have to overcome over the course of the book. So, you know, there are many people that have a, a really bad deal out of life, right? You know, they, they don't have privileges and maybe they don't even have nice parents. So my central question is like, how do you grow up and get past that? How do you not be defined by what happened in your childhood? So that's why I say I think of these as stories ultimately of redemption, although there, there are some dark things in them as well. Yeah. Does anybody have another question? Um, yep, yeah, go ahead, Tina. So when you are writing these dark characters like Jacob, um, how do you not let that affect, like when you're done writing and then you go fix dinner and you don't, how do you get rid of those dark thoughts? That too is, is a really excellent question. And some people have asked me if I would write the story of Helena's mother in The Marsh King's Daughter, um, because she's not very clearly defined in the book because, you know, it's The Marsh King's Daughter and it's all about Helena's relationship with her father. I won't write that because I do not want to inhabit that character's head for the length of time it would take to write a book, you know, to have such horrible things happen to her. So I, I guess it's, you know, there are, there are scenes in the books, both books that, you know, kind of creep me out too, to be honest, but I guess I just set it aside when I'm done writing, you know, the scene's done. <laughs> I don't think about it anymore. And I, I do, when I cook dinner, I don't, weird creepy things you know either just 
Um, just a second here. Um, uh, Lisa just said, um, you have already answered my question, but I wanted to let you know I've read The Marsh King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister, and they were both unput downable. So, oh, wow. thank, you. thank you, Lisa. You know, uh, once in a while, you know, somebody will tell me or I'll read a review that says, you know, I stayed up way too late at night reading this book. And I, my response to that is, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I did my job, right? And of course, Absolutely. I'm a reader. All authors are readers too. And I, I love getting sucked up into a story that I can't put down. So thank you. That's a really high compliment. I appreciate that. Um, I, I have one question. Um, you know, I, it sort of uh, goes along. I, I, I was sort of struck by how you capture the dynamic of a family dealing with a mental health or mental illness. And I'm wondering about the research process that went into that, you know, as, as to, you know, um, what, how you went about finding out information or uh, about how a family deals with that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's no huge reveal if I say that, you know, in The Wicked Sister, Rachel's sister is a psychopath. You'll, you'll catch on to that quite, quite quickly. And so I there were two main articles that I used to research what it's like, what is a child like as a psychopath. And here I should make clear, most um, people say that you can't diagnose a child as a psychopath. They will show the tendencies, but it's not in, because they're still growing and developing. And in, in some ways, a normal child shows psychopathic tendencies. You know, they, they squeeze the kitten around the neck, oh, you know, <laughs> so, so the two main articles I used, one was in the New Yorker and one was in the Atlantic. And these were written, you know, interviews with parents of children who had done terrible things, things that are in the book, actually, you know, the, the things that I have this young child do are things that children have actually done. Another source then I used besides researching that was, um, there's, there's a website called Quora, Q-U-O-R-A, and it's sort of like an interactive Wikipedia. So people who have questions uh, on anything, really, um, an expert will answer it. So I happened upon a section where um, people who say they are psychopaths will answer questions uh, put to them. Mm. And it's very interesting because, you know, someone would ask like, well, how do you feel when you're girlfriend breaks up with you? And the answer is, or not, how do you feel? What do you feel? And the answer is nothing. They feel nothing. And so um, I learned from that, that we probably know psychopaths in real life. Um, psychopaths are not all, you know, deranged killers running around hurting people. They learn how to cope, you know, and get along and have jobs and they can have relationships with other people as long as the relationship serves their needs somehow. So, um, and, and so it was very enlightening and it was my goal to depict a psychopath as they really are, you know, and not as we typically see in movies. Mm -hmm. I will add too, the reason I was drawn to write about that was because uh, some years ago, friends of ours adopted three siblings and obviously they came from a troubled background, you know, that three siblings were available for adoption. The two younger children did really well in the new environment, but the older boy just became more and more violent, violent towards his, his little brother and sister. Um, they tried everything. And when he was 12, they had to put him in an institution. And I think, how heartbreaking is that? How, how do you as a parent decide, okay, we can't handle this anymore. You love your child. They loved the child. So um, that's what I'm trying to do with Rachel's mother's half of the story, which I, I didn't read from tonight, is just show that thought process. You know, you love your child, you, you try to manage as best you can. And in her case, she, she waits a little too long to, mm. to get assistance. Yeah. So those are some of the realities that I was trying to depict in the story. A um, couple more here. Um, let's see here. Um, Maddie wants to know, what are you reading now? Um, 
<laughs> you know, right now I'm really, really pushing to finish that third book. So I'm not reading anything at the moment. However, I just attended a writer's conference in New York and I came home with a big stack of books <laughs> and uh, I should have written down the titles because uh, what they do in at this particular conference is uh, on Saturday morning, there's a debut author's breakfast. And so 20 authors with, you know, first time authors with new books coming out, describe their book. So I bought four of them. I thought they were really wonderful. So um, maybe I, I'll, I'll uh, I don't know how I, how I can call that up. I will say a book that I really enjoyed a couple of years ago is called The Girl in the Mirror by Rose Carlyle. And um, what for me was especially memorable for that was I was asked to read and offer an endorsement for this novel if I enjoyed it um, right near the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when things were really falling apart and we didn't know what, what was going to happen next. I couldn't write at that time because I would just, to me, it felt trivial to write about bad things happening to pretend characters when bad things were happening to real people. I was just blocked. I couldn't write. But then I read this book and I was so caught up in the story. It was such a wonderful a story escape. She has, she has wonderful um, descriptions. It takes place um, in the, in the, um, off the coast of Thailand, I want to say, and Rose herself is a sailor. So it has that authenticity. It takes place on, the, on a sailboat. It's a twin story. Two twins go out on the boat. One comes back. Which one is it? You know, it's a really great story. And when I finished, I was, I realized this is what fiction does. You know, it takes you out of the world you're in and puts you in the author's world. And so then that for me kind of broke that block and I, I was able to go back to writing. So that's a great one. And if you like Marsh King's Daughter, you must read um, Ao and Ivy's book, The Snow Child. Uh, it, her name, her first name is E-O-W-Y-N-I-V, uh, The Snow Child. Her book, also parallels a fairy tale. And uh, I sort of use that as my model when I was, was looking for a structure for my story. It's set in 1920s Alaska and Eowyn lives in Alaska and lives off the grid a bit. So she has that same authenticity into her story as the Marsh King's daughter It's called The Snow Child. So there's two. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, oh, all right. Let's see. Uh, have you written in other genres, genres and when did you decide to become a writer? Yeah, so I started writing um, what would be considered techno thrillers. We recast them as environmental thrillers because that's what I like to read. I love to read Michael Crichton and, and uh, Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child were early inspirations. I read my whole life, but I and I won creative writing awards when I was in high school, but I didn't come to writing until later on. I did other creative things, built that house, and, and you know, I, I dabbled with stained glass and fiber arts and things like that. But when my son was in high school, we were living in St. Ignace at the time. He's a talented writer. And so I was encouraging him to enter the same writing contest that I had done well at. And so for me, it was almost like a classic midlife crisis. What about me? I used to be mm. a writer. So I spent about a year writing short stories to get the creative juices flowing. And then I wrote a novel, which has never been published, but it did get me my literary agent. And, you know, that was 20 odd years ago. And I, I haven't stopped writing since. So it, I got the bug a little later in life. Um, uh, just a um, message here from Robin it says, congratulations on all your success. You graciously came and spoke to our book club a few years ago in South Lyon, and I'm hosting our October meeting and would love to choose the Wicked Sister. Do you ever Zoom with book clubs? <laughs> I do Zoom with book clubs. I <laughs> love to. So, um, you know, there's contact information on my website. My website is karen-dion.com. So uh, write me out of there, remind me, you know, that we talked here tonight and uh, maybe we can set something up for October. That would awesome. be fantastic. Thank awesome. you. Well, um, that's a, it's eight o'clock. Um, do, does anybody have any final questions or comments for, for Karen here? All right. Well, I, I really want to thank you, uh, Karen, for uh, uh, doing this, uh, this, uh, presentation it's re it was really wonderful maybe we can when the movie comes out maybe we can have you come back and talk about the movie and the experience and 
I'd love to hear you, you know, when you can actually like show pictures and talk about the movie in more detail, you know, I'd, I'd love to have you come back and um, maybe talk about that experience. That so. would certainly be fun. Yeah. So uh, that, that's awesome. So yeah, we're, well, look, look for the movie coming out soon, hopefully in theaters and, um, and uh, look for Karen. I'm going to have her back when that movie comes out. So, and we'll, and we'll have her talk about her uh, now reaction to the movie itself and, and what, what she loves about it. So but I want to, I want to thank you all. Like to attend the movie premiere too. So, you know, there's, where is the movie going to premiere? I don't know. There's you no don't know? Date yet. I should have made that clear too. So, but uh, just stay tuned. Uh, honestly, if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll be the first to know. I, I promise you. So, thank uh, you. Awesome. All. Yeah. all right. Well, um, thank you all for coming, and thank you again, Karen, for uh, taking some time out driving to, uh, to driving to your Zoom room. Uh, that sounds almost like a panic room, but a Zoom room um, to uh, do this uh, event with us tonight. And. Um, Thank you uh, all for coming and you all have a wonderful night tonight, okay? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs>